Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Approaching is the 4th of July where many of us celebrate the independence of the birth of our nation. Within that birth we also realize that we're in a time and an age of tremendous debate and confusion is about what direction we want to go when it comes to our inalienable rights. Certainly freedom for all. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is author of the book, The Jefferson Rule. We're going to be taking a look at how our founding fathers had shaped this debate to actually construct the Constitution and how moving forward that each of our presidents and, of course, our political system has decided to shape that particular Constitution in a way that served their own personal interests. As he says, that we won't be able to move forward and to be able to think for ourselves if we keep casting back to those that invoke the ghosts of our founders of past. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, the professor at Georgia State University, where he joined the faculty in 2008. Prior to arriving at Georgia State, he completed a Ph.D. from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and spent postdoctoral year at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences as a visiting scholar. He's joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today to talk about the Jefferson Rule. David C. Hott, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. You must be very passionate about history, especially when it comes to this. Uh, I am. I'm a history p- professor, so uh, you know I believe in the relevance of the past to the present, and I have a fascination with the past uh, for its own sake. So, Now, tell us how you came to shape this book and the importance of why people should pay attention to what we're talking about here today. Well, I was finishing my, my last book, and, um, and, and that book was about uh, religion and law and the way in which Protestant ideals had shaped American law. And um, and as I was finishing that book, the 2009 uh, Tea Party began, and, and um, because I, you know, I'd read a whole bunch of the Founding Fathers uh, for that for that first book, and and I was kind of astounded by the uh, the Tea Party because it seemed to me that the the founders that I read in their papers was not really uh, the founders that many of the leaders of the Tea Party uh, were, were at least invoking in public debate. And I, and I kind of wondered not just where they were getting these founders, but, but where this impulse uh, comes from. Because, you know, as I said, I'm a historian, so I believe in the relevance of the past to the present. But it has to be the actual past, not a kind of invented past. And that's what it seemed <laughs> that the Tea Party was doing, you know. Right. Uh, and so I wound up kind of reading American politics to find out where this impulse came from. And what I found was that people throughout America in history had invoked the Founding Fathers, and that almost invariably they, they kind of invented people that looked a lot like themselves and then used them in, uh, in, in political debate. Now, what's fascinating about that is just to shape this up into a context today that I think our listeners can come to understand as we discuss the Jefferson Rule is something that I'd like to quote from your book here uh, uh, called The Manufacture of Consent. And it's the proper word for such a program is, of course, propaganda, as Harold B. Laswell, an eminent theorist of propaganda, explained in 1927, quote, every cultural group has its vested values to which a would-be leader must appeal. If a political leader sought to create support for his plan, the initiative, quote, must be presented not as a menace and an obstruction, nor as a despicable or absurd, but as a protector of our values, a champion of our dreams, and a model of virtue and prosperity. That really sounds a lot like how they invoke these ghosts of Christmas past, if you will. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, it's it's so interesting because you know if you it, if you go and you you look at at the way in which different politicians invoke the founders and 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 in that that section that you were quoting that was right about when uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt began to invoke the founders. What they do is they they they, they look and 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 the the choice is either to kind of invent the founders wholesale, which sometimes happens, or to kind of pull one select idea about the founders and cast cast it in a way, cast that idea in a way that makes it kind of relevant to your political position in the present. And so what, what FDR was about to do right there was uh, he was facing opposition from the American Liberty League, a group of uh, conservative businessmen who opposed the New Deal. And so he reached back to the founders and he began talking about them as though they were 
kind of new dealers, essentially. And what he did was he, 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 he didn't represent the new deal as a departure from the past. He instead represented it as the realization of old ideals now given a kind of new meaning. And it's, it was perfectly in line with what Harold D. Laswell said was uh, the function of propaganda. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go ahead and turn the clock back to the beginning now. I myself, as I grew up, of course, we all had to take history in grade school. I don't think a lot of us liked it a whole lot. But what's interesting is that's your first imprint, of course, of how America was founded. You've got the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, uh, the Constitution, what government is. And so that's kind of shaped. And, of course, you probably do just enough work, at least for most of us, to hopefully get a passing grade. But as we grow older, we start having more of an interest in history because we see in many ways how it directly affects us today. And to go back and to get a better understanding, a clearer way of seeing what that is, so that we can inherently at least arrive at a truth to make better decisions. <laughs> you know? So let's go back. First of all, I, I used to think that Thomas Jefferson was one that was most responsibly for penning the Constitution, but in fact he didn't really have any hand in drafting it at all. Let's talk about the beginning of the Constitution and its you know, initiation. Yeah, so the, the Constitution came about in, in 1787 after a period of um, several years of activism by certain members of the founding generation. And up until that point, the United States lived under the Articles of Confederation, which was essentially the wartime government created uh, to, to get the, the 13 colonies through the war. And there were some people uh, that were perfectly happy with that, with that government, but, but a number of people were not. And actually, Thomas Jefferson was one of those who was perfectly happy with the Articles of Confederation because he was a guy who opposed uh, government in general. He really feared a centralized government, and he believed that the smallest kind of government was the best kind of government. But Jefferson was in Paris. Uh, he was the U.S. ambassador to Paris. Uh, to France. And so he didn't see all the problems that were created by the Articles of Confederation. And it was instead a group of other people led by James Madison and others who convened the Constitutional Convention and who began a determined process to centralize and strengthen the, cent the central government. Um, and when Jefferson first read this Constitution or read the plan of the Constitution, James Madison sort of told him about it in a letter. He was very much opposed because he feared that this was a step toward despotism, and he never really got over that uh, dislike of the Constitution because he still so feared the, the kind of tyranny of a centralized government that he thought maybe the Constitution was a step toward. Mm -hmm. Now, in paying attention also, we see that Alexander uh, Hamilton was a big player when it seemed to be sort of the money elite into how the government should actually be centralized. He was going to centralize a bank to be able to distribute wealth in the way that basically the government seemed fit in many ways. It seemed toward big business uh, and, and manufacturing versus the agriculturists, so to speak. Yeah, this, you know, when the, when the, the, the American Revolution happened in 1776 and then in 1787 with the, the beginning of the, the U.S. Constitution, this was right at the moment in which the Industrial Revolution was beginning in the United States. It had already begun in, in, in Great Britain. And so there were a lot of questions, not just about the kind of society and country that the United States was, was going to be, but in and, and, and its proper role of government, but also how the government was going to respond to or shape this emerging industrial revolution. And Hamilton was of the opinion that the United States really needed to embrace not just industrialism, but also capitalism. And what that meant for Hamilton was using the government to establish the money supply, to um, kind of uh, make sure that the credit of the United States was good before other nations, and to encourage the industrial revolution in various ways. But for someone like Jefferson, uh, he opposed that because he thought that that was kind of privileging merchant capitalists. In many ways, if you go back and you look at Jefferson, he was kind of anti-capitalist. He, 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 what, what, what we would call capitalism, he called speculation a lot. And so this um, kind of divide about not just the government, but also the economy and the role of the government in this emergent industrial capitalist economy was the central divide of this uh, early period. And the founders in various ways throughout the entire early Republican period. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Now, it's really interesting to see the evolution of that because, you know, of course, as you were saying in the book, uh, that Thomas Jefferson was really opposed to the, con- uh, the Constitution as a way that it was constructed. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, he, he first and foremost, disliked that it didn't have a Bill of Rights. I mean, that's what he, he told his friend James Madison. He thought that the Bill of Rights, or a Bill of Rights, was, was what all uh, governments owed to their citizens as an indication that, you know, these are the rights that we're, we're not going to trample. Uh, but beyond that, he, he had concern that the, um, the government would be, the federal government, that is, would be kind of taken over by people and that they would use that government for their own ends. And so when, when Hamilton began to put forward his economic ideas, Jefferson saw exactly what he had been worried about. He believed that Hamilton was taking over the federal government and using it to enrich the merchant capitalists of the Northeast. And so he began to... Um, mount a campaign, and, and all of the founders believed that, uh, that, that parties were bad. They called them factions. Uh, and, but Jefferson believed that the dangers that Hamilton, um, the Hamilton's program uh, posed for liberty were so great that they justified at least some small t- turn towards partisanship. And so he began accusing his other founders, which were people like Hamilton, uh, George Washington, John Adams, and others, that they were betraying what he called the true principles of the revolution. And he kind of wrapped himself in the founding. And he was really the first to do so in American politics. And built a political party called the Republicans, or sometimes just the Jeffersonians, around this idea that they and they alone represented the true principles of the founding, whereas uh, the other founders had betrayed those principles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really... it's such a fascinating look into the past to realize how these things were shaped when you have two opposing people, you know, taking a look at one has this particular interest, the other is taking a look at human liberties, because liberty was the most powerful thing that Jefferson was trying to get this to help people to achieve, but then there had to be ways to have sort of an open-ended debate so that there was balance into the whole thing, hence checks and balances. Yeah, you know, when I read when I read Jefferson, I I see a lot of talk of liberty. You know, he he at one point called uh, his cause the holy cause of liberty, or I may, may have been the holy cause of freedom. Um, but it's interesting because you know I'm not sure that that's ultimately his motivating principle. He seems to be mostly interested in defending the agricultural way of life, and it's funny because. The, 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 the reference to liberty or the reference to true founding principles really seems to me to be more rhetoric to disguise or uh, to at least cover over his real concern, which is the slave power of Virginia. And, and you see this over and over again in these debates, that what he's concerned about is that the Bank of the United States or Hamilton's manufacturing plan is going to diminish the power and the influence of Virginia. Uh, and, and, but he doesn't say that. He, he instead talks about freedom and liberty and despotism or the true principles of the revolution. Mm-hmm. Now, there you go. Now, we start to really shape into, as we move into Andrew Jackson, <laughs> what really began to culminate as a very harsh and, and almost a dark area of the uh, history of America, and that is the idea of liberty that all men are created equal. And you're talking about at a time and an age we're down in the South there was slavery, and as such, slaves were considered property and not people, so to speak. And so when you have this piece in the Constitution that all men are created equal, bringing that forth today, they seem to use that same thing even as new things approach, but you really don't have a debate. It's sort of like, well, this is what the Founding Fathers meant or what their intention is, and we should honor and respect that due to what they sacrificed in order that we can come to this point today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, when, when, when Jefferson won, he, he beat his opponents, the Federalists, and he came to office in the election of 1800. And it was really at that point that, that this, this rhetoric that I, that I talk about, this kind of wrapping yourself in the founding, that became absolutely common in American politics. And with the coming of Jackson, and Jackson was in the party of, of Jefferson, which was the main party at that point, uh, you know, the, the, the nation 
began to split, and it began to split over a variety of things, uh, primarily over slavery, although it wasn't entirely obvious at that point, uh, but also over uh, the role of the federal government in expanding the nation. You know, the, the nation was moving west, and they were developing um, roads, and they were trying to figure out how to, how to bring the nation together and how to develop it in a, in a seamless way. And many of the people in the South became concerned that this development of the West, uh, and, and in particular the, the, the federal government's um, paying for roads and, and paying for national improvements, was going to come again at, at Southern expense and was going to jeopardize slavery. And so in the period of, or in the, the, the presidency of Andrew Jackson, uh, the parties, and there, was, there had been a one-party system from uh, up till that point, once Jefferson uh, uh, won, the, the Federalists went away and there was just the Republicans, and, and they split apart. All the Jeffersonians split apart, uh, each claiming Thomas Jefferson and through Thomas Jefferson, the founding fathers, but each doing so to radically different ends. So the, the Southerners uh, claimed Jefferson as preeminently a slaveholder and a defendant of slave power. And Andrew Jackson claimed Jefferson as the author of the Declaration of Independence and fundamentally as a Democrat, and so someone who would support the uh, expanding of the vote to white men. And then the people who would become uh, first the National Republicans and then the Whigs, and the, this is like uh, Henry Clay or Daniel Webster, they invoked uh, Jefferson and then the Founding Fathers primarily as people who were in favor of the uh, use of the centralized government to expand the nation as nationalists. And so we see this um, kind of proliferation of uh, uh, references to the Founding Fathers, but all to radically different ends. Now, it's really fascinating to take a look at that because what people need to come to understand as we reach back into history, a lot of people look upon the Civil War as that of slavery and the abolition of slavery. And the fact is, is there was a lot more to that. What was originally happening, as you describe in the book, and I've actually talked with other authors from different perspectives about the Civil War, which was really fascinating because my first question is, what really invoked the Civil War, actually? Was it about slavery, or was there more to it? Now, in your book, you talk about a clear answer that seems pretty consistent with other people that I've talked with, and that is this. That when you take a look at the North uh, and, the, and the direction that they wanted to go, especially when it comes to concerning the Constitution, and as you said, the federal government being able to mandate a central bank, we're expanding out to the West, what was happening was is the fact that they were going to use this government money to be able to fund these businesses in this expansion while basically leaving the South out of it. In fact, they had created a tax tariff on the South that would pay for this expansion effort. Tell us a little bit more about that. Because mm -hmm. I think yeah, that's so very important because when you take a look at we're going to throw slavery into the mix and hide the fact that Basically, we're trying to say that we're a united nation in a way, but except for these nations down here with slaves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, this was called the American system. And, and what the American system uh, sought to do was it relied on, on this centralized bank. Um, and, uh, and, and, it, and it collected taxes through the tariff, which was the main way in which the federal government funded itself. And it funneled that money through the central bank and then used it to build roads uh, which would then uh, develop the, 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 the nation out west. And by west, we mean mainly Midwest and, and the antebellum era. And the theory was that when that happened, that uh, this would create um, a, a kind of a, a, a producer and consumer class in the Midwest that then the South could sell their goods to, and that then all of these raw goods would go to the Northeast where they would be created into textiles and manufactured items, and the entire nation would grow together as a single economic unit. But the South felt like that this tariff created retaliatory tariffs from other nations, and because the South was primarily an export economy, they felt like this American system was really being built by them, but that they weren't getting enough of the, of the rewards. And so mm -hmm. the initial fights over, um, over the federal government and, and so on and states' rights uh, were through the tariff. And this was in the nullification controversy of um, 1830 uh, when South Carolina tried to nullify the tariff and they had a long standoff with Andrew Jackson. But 
going into the Civil War, it shifted because it was no longer just about the tariff. It was also about the ability of slavery to expand into the Western states. And many of the northern states were opposed to the expansion of slavery because they felt that like that would uh, imbalance the, uh, the, the nation between slave and free. And many southern uh, uh, proponents of slavery were deeply uh, offended by the idea that, that they could not take their slaves and migrate to Western territories. And so as the nation approached civil war, it became less about the tariff or uh, the, 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 the economic developments of, sponsored by the, the, the federal government, and much more about the place of slavery in the nation. Mm-hmm. And that's where you see the Nebraska-Kansas divide in some ways, correct? Exactly, yeah. Um, the the, the, the Nebraska-Kansas um, Act was, was this act passed in, in 1854 by Stephen Douglas. And uh, Douglas was a, uh, a Democrat. He was in the party of Jackson. And he needed the South as a Democrat because the South was at that point primarily Democratic uh, in order to ascend into the presidency. And so what he decided to do was to take what was then the Nebraska Territory, and divided into two, Kansas and Nebraska. And he proposed that each of these um, uh, territories vote as to whether or not they would allow slavery in that territory. And uh, that was, to many Northerners, a, a betrayal of, 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 of fairly um, important principle. And uh, what happened was that they uh, first organized Kansas and, and, and started the voting process. And when that happened, thousands of pro-slavery Missourians crossed over into Kansas and began to kind of uh, occupy it. And then meanwhile, many of the most radical Northerners began sending guns into Kansas, and Kansas began to slide into civil war. It's called bleeding Kansas. And once Kansas began to kind of go into civil war, it became apparent just how radical both sides were, and uh, the nation began to kind of careen towards disaster. And, and the important point for my, uh, for my book is that all sides of the debate, both the pro-slavery uh, and anti-slavery uh, uh, people, were, were, were invoking the founders. And both believed that the other side was betraying the true principles of the founding fathers. And, and once the war actually began, uh, both Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States, and Jefferson Davis, the President uh, of the Confederacy, claimed to be representing the true principles of the founders from the um, uh, attack of the other side. Mm-hmm. Now, what really, fi- you know, I find this fascinating because when you reach this pinnacle, this moment in history, uh, as you were describing, Douglas, is that people began to have the perception, let's say, of this day and age, uh, you ask anybody, generally speaking, what was the Civil War about? And they'll say it was about slavery. And you'd say, well, you're partially right. There's obvious from what we're discussing here, you're partially right. But I think when it really comes to invoking the Founding Fathers and moving forward, I don't think anybody was greater, at least during that time, than Abraham Lincoln is how we came to that perception today especially when you consider the fact that during Abraham Lincoln's time, the fact that he was a great orator, the fact that you see more newspapers being produced and that he actually used those to great avail to be able to get his message across, you can see how the perception, for instance, of the Civil War, and I don't mean to keep it that basic, but that's one of those big things where you realize, okay, so the Civil War wasn't just about that, but I could see how it was shaped where we perceive that that's what that was all about today. Yeah, uh, Lincoln was was brilliant at at founders rhetoric, and 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 really he was obsessed with the founders. He he read the founders from an early age, and really from the beginning of his uh, public political statements, he was talking about the founders. And um, but the, the difference between Lincoln and and and, and others is that uh, Lincoln had this kind of complicated rhetorical maneuver that he had to pull off. Because what Lincoln's basic argument was, was that the founding fathers were anti-slavery, but that they didn't eliminate slavery because they couldn't figure out any immediate way to do so. So what they did was they, they created a system in which they would contain slavery, and then it would sort of die a natural death. Well, people like Stephen Douglas said, I mean, that's crazy. They didn't contain slavery. Several new slave states entered when the founding fathers are still alive and still in control of politics. And so I, I don't quite, you know, see, you know, where, where, where you're going. And so what, what, what 
Lincoln did, and he, he made this very important move. And what he said was that they created an idea, the idea of equality. And the theory was, was that that idea was supposed to grow. And that as the idea of equality grew, then slavery itself would kind of go away because uh, the nation would uh, be fully committed to its, its, the realization of, of, of equality. So even if they didn't actually try to do anything to limit slavery, that didn't matter, according to Lincoln. And, and, it's, and it's that rhetorical move that uh, many modern liberals uh, copy. That is, they, they divorce the, the kind of the principles from the actual people. And they say that these principles grow uh, over time, and and Lincoln kind of refined it the more the more uh, they got, uh, the more he got to the Civil War, and eventually once the Civil War began, he kind of he gave up on it. He didn't he didn't talk about the founders as much, um, except to say uh, in the Gettysburg Address, for example, that now they were. Uh, they being Lincoln's generation, was striving for a new birth of freedom, a kind of a, a second founding that was going to take these founding principles of equality and then give them uh, new meaning. But it's really Lincoln's um, really profound uh, rhetorical ability that uh, shapes the, the modern idea of sometimes it's called living constitutionalism or uh, the, the kind of the liberal uh, invocation of the founding fathers. So it's the idea that the Constitution originally was sort of an experiment that would continue to grow and change and adapt over time because society itself would do the very same thing. Would that be a correct assumption? Yeah, yeah. And what, what Lincoln said was that, um, that the Founding Fathers never believed that or, or did anything to affect the equality of all white men. But by 1850... Nobody would deny the equality of all white men. I mean, in, in 1787, many people would deny the equality of all white men. But in 1850, no one would deny it. And so to Lincoln, that was exactly an indication of the, the power of the founders' announcement of an idea. And it's that idea that matters. And, and societies would change, and, 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 and uh, uh, the, the, the makeup of the United States would change. But the idea itself would kind of grow larger and adapt itself to its specific social moment. I think what was fascinating as we talk about Lincoln and Douglas as they ran head-to-head -head against each other was the debate and how Lincoln actually framed that debate using facts. <laughs> and that was the Cooper debate. Tell us a little bit about that because I think that really begins to shape a lot of how what you see happening today happen. For instance, we're going to go ahead and plug away and say this. We'll back it up by a few facts, and if you're not so sure, then we'll run back to the Founding Fathers and say, how do you ever trip over your father's ghost? <laughs> uh, to what, me, so that's the, the way I, I love the way you wrote this book because y you really can clearly see they were having the same kind of challenges then as we are today. The only difference is, is they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have Twitter, and they didn't have cable <laughs> television, for Christ's sakes. Right. Oh, excuse me right. for anybody out there who's Christian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the 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 the, uh, the, the Cooper Union uh, speech was was the speech that catapulted Abraham Lincoln to the presidency, and and he, he first needed to win the Republican nomination, and so this was a really important speech. And and um, going into that speech, there were all these kind of questions about the Founding Fathers. Stephen Douglas was trying to claim the Founding Fathers. Of course, the, the Southern politicians were trying to claim the Founding Fathers. And so he started out that speech, and it was unlike almost any other speech that I've, I've, I've come across in the 19th century. Because, you know, this is a massively important speech, but he starts out by saying, you know, who do we mean when we say the Founding Fathers? And he says, well, you know, these are the 39 men that signed the U.S. Constitution. And so let's start there. And he starts, like, counting. How many of them are uh, in favor of slavery? Well, actually, not that many. A clear majority were in favor, in favor of abolishing slavery. And then he kind of kind of works out from there, like he's literally kind of counting. He's like, well, what about the men that are in the, 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 the first U.S. Congress? What about them? And, and then he starts counting there. And he's sort of slowly adding fact upon fact to, to try to show that, at least in his counting, that the founding generation pretty clearly was anti-slavery. And then he makes this really important move because he says, you know, our opponents call us radical. 
we're the radicals. <laughs> but actually, we're standing with the founding fathers. You know, I've right. just shown, I've done this math. And, and so we are the true conservatives. And, and uh, it's really striking that going into civil war, everyone was claiming to be the conservatives, by which they meant uh, they are the ones that are standing with the founding fathers. Right. And what's even more fascinating to note, too, is the fact that here's Abraham Lincoln years before one Thomas Harding, I believe it was, who was actually one to have actually coined the term the founding fathers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, a lot of people would think the founding fathers was actually something that was stamped on the Constitution. This is from our founding fathers, when in fact that didn't occur until years and years and years and years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 1916. Yeah, if you read the, 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 the um, politicians of the 19th century, they refer to our forefathers. Sometimes right. they refer to our fathers or the fathers of our country, something like that, but never the founding fathers. That had to wait till 1916. Now, Theodore Roosevelt, as he came into politics, was one of those that seen uh, started presenting the idea, well, maybe we ought to take a look at this Constitution and, you know, because things are more progressive this day and age. We don't have, or we're faced with different challenges than they were then. Tell us how that began to shape how he was beginning to use the founding fathers in his way, but sort of push an agenda in a different direction. Yeah, well, so after the Civil War, the, the kind of founders rhetoric that I'm talking about, it, it, it kind of went away for about two generations because, uh, because it was so caught up in, in, in the Civil War that many politicians began to think, you know, the founders rhetoric might be a little dangerous. And beginning in the 20th century with the with uh, um, early progressives, and Theodore Roosevelt was was one of those progressives. Uh, many of those progressives began to think, you know, the nation is just so different than it was in 1776 or even 1787 when the U.S. Constitution was created. Uh, you know, this is a nation of immigrants and skyscrapers, and uh, you know, just just massive in scale, continental in scale, and the 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 vision of the founding fathers, you know, that can't just be applied in a in a one to one way uh, across that that century or more at that point. And so what what uh, Theodore Roosevelt said was that the founding fathers their primary use was as an example of self government. And he began to do essentially what Lincoln did, which was to take these ideas of the founders and then kind of apply them in, in new ways given these uh, new challenges that the nation was facing. And that was a fairly common move within uh, progressivism, either to assume a kind of living constitution. Woodrow Wilson was the one who, who really um, uh, advanced that in a theoretical way. Or sometimes some progressives simply said, you know what, we're so far removed from the, uh, the world of the founding fathers, we need to start over. We need a, a new constitution entirely, or we need to pretty massively amend the constitution. And so a lot of the amendments that you see from, from that era, uh, the 16th Amendment, which allowed an income tax, the 17th Amendment, which allowed the direct election of U.S. Senate, Senators, the 18th Amendment, which was a prohibition amendment, uh, and then the 19th Amendment, which uh, allowed for women's voting rights, all were put forward by progressives who were looking to change the Constitution to kind of move it out of the, um, I guess it would be the 18th century, and into the 20th century, mm -hmm. and to kind of overcome the founding fathers. Now, what's really fascinating about today's debate, especially when you look at an economy that kind of tanked in 2008, we seem to think we're recovering, but then we hear there's this huge economic bubble that's around the corner that's going to be even worse, as we hear a lot of cry uh, and outrage about how we need to have income wealth redistribution. And that's sort of <clears throat> uh, something that began during Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration, and I'd like to quote from your book on this because I think this is a very clear thing here that could shape a, a neat little bit of conversation here. But, quote, it must have now become clear to every thinking man, Irene DuPont of the DuPont Company wrote to a confidant that the so-called New Deal advocated by the administration is nothing more or less than the socialistic doctrine called by another name. The trend toward governmental control, DuPont feared, would eventually culminate in income distribution that would sap the work ethic and entrepreneurial drive of the nation. Now, I think that's important in this book because when you take a look at how we came to the Revolutionary War to come to America to get away from British rule, we were all really looking for freedom, the freedom to be able to pursue our interests, 
uh, to, to, to drive and to be as, as great as we can become, to have that freedom to do that. That's one of the things that makes America as a nation so great, why a lot of people around the world would love to come here, because that opportunity does exist. But you think about these people that begin to be entrepreneurial and they begin to put in the sweat equity and the hard work and they begin to build something. And you have these people all sitting around waiting for the government to say, well, they're too big, what's in my cut? But they didn't have anything to do with it. You can see how a whole new debate emerges about how much should government interfere with that enterprising spirit of America. But it tends to happen, especially during the Obama administration. Yeah, you know, although I would I would make a distinction between our debate now and the debate in the Great Depression because remember this is the Great Depression. You right. Know, there were no, there were uh, in, in some cities like seventy five percent unemployment and people were starving. You and know? not only that, so the too, question was yeah. I was going to say not only that too. There was a lot of resources that were being hoarded and set aside as people were losing homes. So there were a lot of I, I totally agree with you there. So go ahead, yeah, continue. Yeah. Well, so you know, the debate in the, in the Depression era was often not what's the role of government, but why can't government do more? And it was exactly what that was exactly the kind of impulse that people like Dupont feared would culminate in this kind of socialist takeover of government. And um, you know, in early on, Roosevelt said that he was a reformer. He wasn't a radical. He was he was he was the businessman's best friend because he was the one standing in the way of truly radical experiments. That he wanted to kind of save capitalism from itself. Uh, but the Duponts and, and eventually the Duponts uh, gathered many of their um, business friends and started this organization that I mentioned at, at the beginning of the interview, the American Liberty League. They believed that regardless of what Roosevelt said, the net effect of that uh, that New Deal would be a kind of creeping tyranny that would inevitably erode their power and their profits. And so they, they fought the New Deal tooth and nail. And, and it, there's no way to say it other than that they lost miserably. The, the American Liberty League disbanded in 1940. They got crushed in everything that they tried to do. And uh, the, the, the New Deal was, was utterly ascendant and, and set the, the kind of the legislative trajectory of the nation for the next 40 years. But if you're looking for the origins of modern day conservatism, it's, it's right there. Because what they did was uh, they, they continued to be concerned, and it, and it was their sons in particular, that um, began looking around and they, they, they needed somebody to kind of articulate their cause because they weren't doing a good job of it at all. They, they, they were getting killed in, in the, the, uh, the elections. Uh, and, and, and they found that person in the 1950s in the person of Ronald Reagan uh, mm -hmm. because Reagan was a genius at, at articulating exactly these concerns that, that, that you, were, you were referring to, this fear that, that the, the liberalism of the era was going to sap the entrepreneurial spirit of the nation, and that the real um, kind of uh, uh, genius of the nation was, was kind of being cast aside. But Reagan did something better than anybody else, and that was that he was able to take that, which, which you know, truthfully did not really... Um, sell that well to, to, to many people on the street. I mean, this was, that was exclusively an argument that in that time appealed to the rich. What he was able to do was to take that and connect it to the founding fathers. He was able to say that the, the founding fathers created these principles, and it's those principles that are being um, thrown away, and that's why you, the common man on the street, need to be very concerned about it. And, and it was with Reagan that you see that, that real turn toward the founding fathers in conservative politics. Now, speaking of Reagan, though, he was also the one that was uh, very much like Jefferson, at least in spirit, but certainly not in practice, that talked about how government was getting too big, it was becoming a problem, what we need is a smaller government, when in fact he was the beginning of one of the big deficit jumps in American history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, Reagan was, was is this interesting figure. If you if you go to, um, you know, he he was of course a failed B list actor. Failed is too strong. He was a B list actor, sort of over his prime. In the 1950s, he began to. He was do a this submarine commander in a movie once. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Um, <laughs> Couldn't help that one. <laughs> but he, he <laughs> had a cowboy too. But, but anyway. And the cowboy, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but in the, in the 1950s, he was the head of this show called General Electric Theater. And he, as part of that show, he, he, he became um, 
kind of more politically active. And he began to make these political pronouncements. And he also began to travel around the country and meet conservative audiences. And uh, he began developing what, what reporters started calling the speech. And he gave this speech um, really at the, uh, the behest of, 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 of some wealthy California patrons in, in 1964 in support of Barry Goldwater's uh, presidency. This was a, uh, it was broadcast on national television a week before the election. And if you go back and you, you, you watch that speech, you can actually, if you type in uh, a time for choosing, which is what the speech is called uh, into YouTube, it's, it's, it's online. The Reagan Library has put it online. And you see that his central concern in that speech is uh, with the deficit. He believed that, that the deficit was um, too large, that it was uh, eventually going to come crashing down, and, and the entire nation was going to come crashing down with it. And really, that was his entire political platform, I mean, with, with just a few additions for the next 20 years. Um, uh, but once he got into office in 1980, he faced this problem, which, as you point out, uh, he created a massive deficit. And he didn't quite seem to know what, what to do with it. And, um, and so in order to kind of cover up that policy failure, what I, what I try to show in, in the book is that he began talking about the Founding Fathers. And, and, and what he said was that uh, you know, we're not concerned with numbers. Uh, or, or, or simply budget items. What we want is to preserve the sacred fire of liberty. And he, he began doing that from 1982 all the way through the end of his presidency in, in, in uh, 1988, uh, recasting the debate, not in terms of numbers, but, but in terms of these founding principles. And he was a genius at it. Now, I appreciate you saying that, the sacred. <laughs> because when you take a look at how our political landscape is, especially today, is we tend to do that when we see a direction that we're going, well, that people aren't so sure about, they're maybe sitting on the fences. So you go back and you stamp the founding fathers, you know, for the blood they shed for our country to enjoy the freedoms. It's much like, at times, the Bible debate. You know, when you're out there thinking that your faith yeah. is being tested, you're uncertain about what the Bible said. Well, you know, it said this, and this is what God wanted. You know, and you yeah. see the same thing happen even in religious circles. And I know that you had wrote a book defending American religious, uh, American religious uh, neutrality, is that, you know, you see the same thing happening when there seems to be uncertainty about a direction a particular person of influence is going, especially when it comes to you know, them wanting, let's say, a political office or maybe even preaching on the pulpit of a local church, they'll invoke that as a way of saying, well, if you're not so sure about me, refer to the Bible. <laughs> you know, that can actually mm -hmm. be very dangerous, yeah. as it has been very dangerous, uh, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I think what it, what it is is that it's a conversation stopper. You know, like if you and I are having a kind of a religious debate, and I'm like, well, no, no, you know, well, that's, that's uh, look so. on, 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 exactly, right. you know. I mean, it, 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 it need not be necessarily, but, um, but, but at the very least what it does is it changes the quality of the conversation. Like, mm. like if we're having a conversation about a particular policy, let's say we're talking about Obamacare, and I'm saying, well, look, you know, it has these kind of built-in features, and it'll do these kind of, you know, policy goals, and, and I think it'll work quite well. And you say, but uh, it betrays the fundamental ideals of liberty put forward by the Founding Fathers. Well, suddenly we're no longer having a policy debate. Mm -hmm. We're having a much more uh, fundamental debate about first principles. And, and that, that debate is, is harder for politics because suddenly you can't compromise with me because you've made this a debate about first principles. You, you have to resist me tooth and nail because otherwise you're compromising your fundamental principles. And so it becomes much harder to actually create policy, to enact political compromise, to move forward, even if we disagree, because we're, we're locked into our corners, each kind of invoking the founding fathers. And I think you see that all the time in political debate right now. And it is really uh, problematic, if not uh, dangerous at times. Well, David, I'm glad that you brought that particular thing up about Obamacare because there's a real interesting way to look at that. On the one hand, it's trying to get citizens to be able to have access to health care. I mean, how many people out there have actually tried to go to the hospital just to maybe take a look at, I've got this infection or this pain, can I get a, a look at this? Well, do you have insurance? Well, no, I don't. Well, do you have cash? Well, not at this moment. Well, then we can't treat you. So you can see how they're trying to pave the way for maybe that not to happen. But then on the other hand, to pass or invoke a law that says you're required to have health insurance 
or you're going to be penalized, well, now you're turning that over to a private industry. Now, certainly we know in our medical system that it's pretty broken, and the reason is, is that the insurance companies became these middlemen that in effect become the kind of people that tell us how we should be treated with our health. In other words, well, if you want to go in and get treatment for that, maybe we'll pay for it, maybe we won't, that sort of a thing, you know. So you can see how that debate kind of goes on and on and on. But I like how you say, well, you know, our founding fathers said that we were entitled to maybe health care to, to be healthy, for instance. Then, as you said, you remove the debate because you turn that more into a moral debate. And generally, a, a moral approach is one that's based on a systematic set of values that you probably learned through your parents, so it's more of a set of biases. And you can see, as you said, you take and you just cut that opportunity off to say, let's shape and continue this, which was originally what Thomas Jefferson, in a way, was kind of ardently saying we should be doing, is making this a continuing debate and the opportunity to do so for the greater good rather than serving the small masses. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I thought I mean, Obamacare you know, I... was a great way to, to kind of illustrate all of that. Yeah, because I think there are some legitimate, you know, I mean, no one's happy with Obamacare. You know, liberals want single payer. You know, they hate the uh, the kind of Frankenstein quality of, Obama, of, of Obamacare, the funneling of money to, to private insurance corporations. You know, conservatives hate Obamacare because it comes with a mandate. You know, you must have it, otherwise we're going to fine you, which seems uh, wrong to them. Uh, but these are policy considerations, you know, and I don't think that if you go and dig around in the Founding Fathers that you're going to find a whole lot of uh, of help about uh, a, 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 a health care system that, that didn't exist when they still bled people in the 18th century, you know, and uh, the kind of very complicated set of trade-offs that, that exist with, with this, this policy. And so it's really, it's a policy debate. And I don't think the Founding Fathers can really help us in that, in that way. And I think their, their presence in that debate really only messes it up. And, um, and, 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 and and does damage to, to our, our ability to kind of address these, these, these real problems. Well, you've certainly had a, a fair amount of people take a look at what you've written here and say, you know, it's about time that we start to wake up, each and every one of us. One thing I've consistently done on this show over the years is you'll have people that will go out there and point and rail their fingers at who the bad guy is. And I remember a fifth-grade teacher told me once, when you point your finger outside of yourself to blame for the situation you're in, remember that you've got three fingers pointing back at yourself. <laughs> so I ultimately like to say, where is your responsibility in this? Do you think for yourself, you know, why do you decide that you're on that side of the fence on this? Have you considered the whole thing for the greater good? You know, to have that kind of debate, and but yet we're so inundated with the media 24-7, it almost seems to be 48-7 anymore, that it's yeah. almost as though people don't know which way to go. And I say, well, why don't you stop, take a look at where your feet are, and start thinking as you take each step forward. That's what your book certainly tries to help people consider. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that, that, that's exactly right. You know, I'm, I'm really concerned about the way in which um, the Founding Fathers are, 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 are propaganda, but, but in general, I'm concerned just about the propaganda. You know, we, we are inundated with this, this kind of uh, rhetoric on, on, on all sides. And, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it, it's disheartening, the level of our, our political debate right now, where that, the debate itself seems wholly inadequate to the problems that we face. And mm -hmm. I think even if we you know, disagree on what those problems are, I don't think anybody would say that, that the United States uh, doesn't face challenges. And, um, and you know, when you look at the, the kind of the level of political debate, the, the, those challenges don't seem to be addressed in any, in any way that, that suggests uh, a kind of a, a political understanding of their of their scale or their or their urgency, and so, you know, I would I would love it if uh, if if people sort of cut free from the, the the rhetoric and the propaganda of of our politicians and began to think for themselves. And as we take a look at the reality, also the political landscape, uh, we're uh, certain that money has a tremendous influence on that. In fact, as uh, I've talked about on the show with uh, many guests, you know, it gets to a point when it comes to the voters going to the booth that many times they will vote 
by casting their vote to the one who's most likely to win instead of the one who's maybe most likely to make that difference. And you kind of wonder, how do you help people to at least change course enough to realize how empowered they can truly be with a system that for the most part may not seem to work as effectively as we would like, but it has the potential to get there. But again, what are you personally doing to ensure that you're making the kind of decision that is not only right for you, but righter for the greater good as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was just um, uh, a reader uh, recently contacted me, and, and we had a, a kind of a long exchange, and um, and we were talking about about this this very issue, and and um, and I made the point that what I would I would like to see, and it's it's not going to happen, but I I would really like to see it is a, a bunch of smaller parties rather than than two parties, you know, a bunch of smaller parties that have to form coalitions that can be, you know, as, as, uh, as specific as they want on, on, on issues. But uh, when you have to form coalitions, you have to compromise. And, and, and compromise is, is really the name of, of, of politics. And, and we just don't see that uh, so often in, in today's political uh, arena. I might finish with a quote here from your book, which is uh, toward the, was actually the end, is the historian's task, Tony Jutt once said, is to tell what is almost always an uncomfortable story and to explain why the discomfort is part of the truth we need to live well and live properly. <laughs> and certainly when you start exposing yourself to the real history of things, you realize, well, that isn't what I was taught. That's the uncomfortable feeling. But now that you've discovered an inherent truth about a perception you have, what is your next step? And that becomes even more uncomfortable, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I would say the next step is to, um, as you say, to, uh, to, to, to kind of detach from, from the rhetoric and to think, well, you know, I, I still believe these things, but now I can't justify it by the founding fathers, so why do I believe these things? And to, to really articulate in a more uh, clear-minded way what underwrites uh, our political preferences, and also recognizing that, you know, if, if, if this isn't based on founding principle, then, you know, we may need to compromise uh, in, in the course of actual debate. And you know what, I think one of the strongest uh, quotes that we can use from that, especially in today's day and age, with the Supreme Court finally allowing gay marriage to happen by constitutional right, is that the quote that should be celebrated but yet does need compromise because we all think and we live differently is the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. You know, there it is right there. And you throw that out there and say, well, what does that mean to you and to you and to you? You know, how can we all have this and yet work and live together and all be harmonious? Boy, that's a great human experiment that certainly I don't think the Founding Fathers either have the foresight of in today's world, or maybe they did by accident. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, I really, I really like Lincoln I, on, on this, I have to say. I, 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 I like the, the notion that he has that, you know, the Founding Fathers kind of announced an idea. And um, whether they even understood that idea or whether they, they, they recognized its, its full import, they announced an idea. And they did it in two different places. They did it in the Declaration of Independence, which is what you just quoted. And they did it in the Constitution. And you remember that the Constitution begins with the phrase, we the people. And it doesn't say we the founding fathers. It right. says we the people. We're the forefathers. And the thing about we the people, uh, exactly, or forefathers, <laughs> um, uh, the thing about we the people is, is that it's, it's ever-changing and ever-renewing. You know, the people are leaving the scene and more people are coming on the scene. And so ultimately the U.S. government is an experiment based on uh, a people that's, that's dynamic and, 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 and a society that's, that's dynamic. And so to the extent that, that the, the, the founding fathers uh, matter, it, it must be, I think, as, as, as Lincoln says, as uh, uh, people who announced a principle that we, as the people, now need to determine what uh, that principle now means in our own time and apply it uh, uh, accordingly. And I, I think I like that, uh, that idea a lot. You know, David, I think it's fascinating as we take a look at this and we pull back. You know, a lot of the world may not like our government for good reasons. But what's fascinating is the outside world looking in at the United States 
sees that spirit. They know and they embrace and they come here knowing that if they get the opportunity to have that spirit, they'll use and invoke it in the way that maybe they didn't know back in the day when it was created, but it was certainly intended that they can come here and they can actually have that opportunity. And I think it's fascinating that we, the people here of the United States, have been so steeped in it. It's kind of like when you're kind of working in a business and you've got a constant problem going on and you can't see your way out of it. You've got to bring in those fresh outside eyes to make you see something you didn't see before. That maybe we as Americans should see more of what the outside world sees of us in spirit. Perhaps we'll start making a little bit better decisions about the scape of our politics and the direction this country wants to go. What are your final thoughts on that? I, I, I like it. It sounds good to me. You know, I'm in. Uh, I'm in. I grew up in Texas, and I'm, I'm actually with my in-laws as we as we speak in in, in Houston. <laughs> and they're pretty good and, about the Fourth uh, of July down there. I know that much. <laughs> they are indeed. And um, and you know, I was driving by um, the city hall, and uh, they they have, I guess, an election uh, coming up, or, or or recently passed, or something. And there were all these placards uh, with names that were uh, last names that were. Pretty obviously, they weren't born here, or their parents weren't born here. You know, Pakistani names, Indian names, and I was really astounded by that. And then I was really heartened by it because it's an indication of this um, real, you know, ever renewing quality of, of the American people. Uh, and and it's hard for me to imagine that the founding fathers could have driven by uh, that and, and known what what to make of it. And, and nevertheless, they gave us that that phrase, "We the people," that we can we can make sense of it. And I think that's that's really uh, a useful way to, to think about it. And maybe in the end, I don't know for those people out there, if you're a fan of Star Trek, but I'm uh, sure Gene Roddenberry <laughs> certainly had one heck of a vision when he seen the whole planet working together toward the cause of exploring curiosity for our individual talents. That's an amazing way to there see the world. There you go. Home. Amazing stuff. Now, I just have one final question, though. Why the title The Jefferson Rule? Uh, you know, it, it's funny because um, my my editor actually came up with that, and it turns out that uh, I had one notion in mind, and she had a different notion in mind. I had the notion in mind that Jefferson had created this rule in American politics that all of our policies must um, be justified by the founding fathers, and that he was the very first to do so. But that thereafter, uh, it, it, it continues on as a kind of implicit, but but nevertheless binding rule of American politics. And what she meant it as is essentially the Jefferson reign. That that Jefferson has himself ruled through this rule, uh, and that we see his influence uh, uh, today. And so. I could go either way, but I, I think it, it, it's this, this, this kind of implicit rule of American politics that I was trying to, uh, to point out and ultimately to call into question. Well, I certainly hope that you've enjoyed your time here on our program today and that the spirit of what you've put out there for uh, the people to read has certainly been respected. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can be sure to find out what's going on as you pick up the Jefferson Rule, our guest today, David Sihat. You can also find out more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We encourage you to sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter and also follow us on Twitter. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.